intellectual feast and treat this afternoon with a set of conversations that rarely happen under the same umbrella, which is to think about property rights across three domains, wireless spectrum, water, and mineral rights. And we thought, who could pull this all together and give our keynote address? And we got our first choice. It's Richard Epstein. Richard will be here to take it all in. And Richard knows a lot about a lot of things, but he really, really knows a lot about property and the common law. These are three areas that don't get the attention they deserve, either individually, let alone collectively. There's a lot to uh, mine here, no pun intended. I want to say a few words before I get started with our overview panel, and I said we'll have three panels on the main topics, and then we'll go to Richard to bring things home. First and foremost, Anna Noskesi, who's here along with Jamie and Cactus, have put in a lot of work along with a number of student workers around today's conference. Just want to start by acknowledging them and how great they've been. Um, second, it's worth saying this is an event that is uh, a partnership where Silicon Flatirons is um, hosting it, but we're able to be working with our friends at the Getches Wilkinson Center for Natural Resources, Energy, and Environment, which has an energy innovation initiative that William Boyd over here is the director of. Uh, and those of you who cross interests across technology and natural resources issues, uh, if you don't know William, then um, please uh, do say hi to him at one of the breaks or at the end. I also um, want to uh, give a shout out for a conference they're having on June, we're not going to remember it, 8th? Ramsey, remember the date? What's that? 5th and 6th. Uh, Patty Limerick has been working with the Getz's Working Center on this conference. Patty is really one of our treasures here at the University of Colorado. We love collaborating with her and encourages us at Silicon Flatirons to do more boundary jumping activities so we get to bring her over, whether it's talking about patents or the web in the West and today, uh, these three domains. It's always a pleasure to have Patty here. Um, Ramsey Croft up from Aspen has been helping with this as well. She's been a great supporter at the law school. So we have a lot of people who will be involved in that conference June 5th and 6th. If you have interest in that, um, you can ask any of the people I just uh, gave a shout out to. And then um, I'd also want to encourage people to uh, follow the Silicon Flatirons norms, which are as follows. When we have discussion afterwards, the first question will go to a student. And also at the reception at the end, we strongly encourage all the professionals to engage with our students. Finally, a number of folks who have been great supporters of Silicon Flatirons, what we've been doing, as I mentioned, this whole idea of boundary jumping has been an exciting area this year. We keep getting more ambitious. A few weeks ago, we had a conference on sci-fi and entrepreneurship. Last year, we had one comparing the entrepreneurial scenes in uh, technology and brewing. We uh, had a really good discussion um, you know, uh, on uh, health care earlier. So we're really trying to broaden our reach. As you have other thoughts for us, uh, no daring idea is too far afield for us. Feel free to let me know. So let me segue to our opening panel and three uh, terrific minds and practitioners. All three of these panelists has uh, serious expertise that we will be calling on. Bruce Kramer is a Thompson Visiting Professor of Law here at the University of Colorado. He is an authority on mineral rights, uh, oil and gas most particularly, is really a leading figure and we're so happy to have him teaching oil and gas here. Sitting next to him, David Rattle is the Chief Counsel at the um, Commerce and Technology uh, of Commerce and Technology at the uh, U.S. House Committee on Energy and Commerce on uh, Matters Wireless Spectrum. He really is a go-to guy and has been a deep thinker on this topic. We're thrilled to have him out here for this discussion. And finally, Charles <coughs> Wilkinson, who's a distinguished professor of the University of Colorado. He's our Moses Lasky professor here in the law school. He's the faculty director of the Getchus Wilkinson Center and um, really an amazing authority and leading light on all matters natural resources. And so I will start with broad questions that cut across these three fields. The theory is to set the stage and underscore the types of connections that we can come back to and reflect on in these areas. The broad topic is around property rights. And one idea here is that property rights can be crafted and designed 
with particular economic and social goals in mind. One design principle that has been used in different ways with respect to mineral rights, spectrum rights, and water is a use it or lose it requirement. And depending on which regime you're more schooled in, you have a different perspective on this. So when you hear from Stan Dempsey on minerals, where this has been used extensively, um, you will hear about this in a fairly complementary fashion. Um, my friends in the water world are a lot more skeptical about whether this works and more particularly aware of the unintended consequences. And spectrum, this has kind of been a little bit of an afterthought. Um, it gets, it gets uh, styled slightly differently in spectrum. Um, you, you hear the word build out requirements in spectrum as the analog, which is if you don't build out to serve a whole area, then you lose some spectrum. This was used in the most recent set of auctions that happened, the so-called um, uh, you know, uh, 700 megahertz auction. So I'll start with David uh, on this, because I sort of put spectrum here as the case that is most um, undetermined. When you hear the, the idea of a build-out requirement or a use it, lose it requirement for spectrum, um, what are your thoughts or reactions on this type of requirement? Um, positive, negative, both, what have you. Well, first, Phil, thanks for, for having me out here to Colorado. It's really nice to be out to, to join you all, and thanks to the Silicon Flatiron Center uh, uh, as well. Use it or lose it has been a concept that has played differently in different areas of spectrum policy. And in particular, the, one of the major inflection points in use it or lose it has been when spectrum licensing went from the original, um, what we affectionately call, beauty contests in the, uh, in the olden days when we literally did comparative hearings at the Federal Communications Commission to determine what the best use of the spectrum was, as opposed to what we do now, which is auction spectrum off to the highest bidder. Uh, use it or use it was used very effectively uh, in the days of comparative hearings. And it's still to this day in some of the services that are more restrictive. Um, you look at the broadcast band, and I think the broadcast band is a great example. When you get a construction permit from the FCC, if you fail to perfect and actually build out a broadcast station, you lose the right to use that piece of spectrum. Um, my subcommittee chairman, Chairman Greg Walden, started in the broadcast industry before becoming a member of Congress. Uh, in radio broadcasting, and tells a great story about this, uh, he wanted to put a translator up for one of his radio stations. And, uh, the story we usually tell is based on how long it takes the FCC to actually do anything. It took them 10 years to approve his translator uh, application. But the important part for the purposes of, of property rights is that they then only gave him 30 days to perfect. And they said, OK, here you go. You can have your translator. Get it up and running in 30 days, or we're going to assign that frequency to somebody else. Uh, so in those bands, it has tended to work pretty well in terms of trying to keep folks you know, to, true to the things that they had committed to the FCC. The wireless auctions have been a place where they've been trying to try these out to some limited success. And I think one of the things that, from our perspective, when we look at this um, in Washington and we're looking at the policy, is that we don't want to blindly adhere to a use it or lose it policy. Um, when they're applied rationally, the use it or lose it policy can work really well. But unlike minerals, for example, where you know, there is a finite amount of ore in a given place, um, spectrum literally if you don't use it in this time parameter, it's gone and you have to move on. And so um, looking at it in that perspective, you don't want to apply a use it or lose it policy if there's a rational economic reason not to use it yet. Um, and a great example of that is um, the 2.3 gigahertz band, uh, affectionately known as WCS. Um, it had a real interference problem, a real interference problem between WCS and the satellite digital audio radio service, which is XM and Sirius Radio. Um, Building that out and spending the kind of money you would need to use it so you don't lose it wouldn't make much sense if once the interference parameters got cleaned up, you would have had to go back and reinvest again to make it work the way it was supposed to in the first place. Same goes for when you're looking at the fact that the technology in the wireless space turns over so quickly. Um, the technology standards are done through a collaborative process um, with industry. If you know full well that investing in the current standards is going to be overtaken by technology within a year, 
there should be some flexibility to say, okay, we get it. Making the multi-billion dollar investment you would have to make to use it right now doesn't make a whole lot of economic sense. So we'll say maybe you lose it at a different point if you don't invest. And that's really where we are at this point. Um, we're starting to see, as, as Phil pointed out, that in the 700 megahertz auction, there were some build-out requirements. We're going to be coming up on those dates uh, fairly soon in terms of uh, whether or not people have built out. Uh, some of those bands we've already seen that this action actually was taken. Uh, a number of small wireless providers had licenses that have potential interference with channel 51 in television and have proceeded to go get waivers of the build-out requirement because it didn't make sense to force them to build out in an uneconomic situation. So from our perspective, it's, it, it's really a mixed bag. I'd like to be able to give a single answer, but it would be completely inaccurate. Well, I have kind of teed this up as just that, which is it's worked well in minerals, mixed bag and spectrum, and the water law cases, I think, can be a cautionary one. Before I get to the cautionary case, uh, Bruce, as I previewed, there is a lot of thought within the mineral rights world that user lose it has been an effective tool. If you agree with that, why does it work there? What's, what's the uh, rationale behind it, and how has it been effective? Well, it, it's, again, with, um, when you're talking about property rights, and uh, in oil and gas specifically, uh, or fugacious minerals as opposed to uh, hard rock minerals, uh, the whole notion revolves around the, uh, the right one has to exclude others from its use. That works very well in fixed um, non-movables as the civil law or immovable, immovables as the civil law would put it. It doesn't work well when you have a community resource and that obviously when you're talking about oil and gas underneath the ground you're talking about a resource that is not going to be specifically limited to surface ownership kinds of rights. Uh, the rule of capture, which is uh, the, our terminology for the use it or lose it uh, thing, is not time barred. What it is barred, the lose it only comes into play if there is another owner over that common source of supply uh, who has the resources, the technology, the, uh, uh, the ability, and the inclination to tap into that common source of supply. And given the fact that it is a finite resource, uh, to use the analogy from uh, there will be blood, uh, is for people who are sucking on the same, or from the same glass uh, of ice cream, uh, ice cream soda. Whoever starts first and has the biggest lung power owns all of the, uh, of the soda or all of the resource. That obviously encourages people who are afraid of losing that resource to develop it immediately, which is why in the 1930s, every time there was a new large field in Texas that was developed, the price of oil went from 15 cents a barrel to two cents a barrel. Okay, and therefore, you know, National Guard was put, was called out in in Texas to deal uh, with the circumstances that arise from that. But the whole notion of the rule of capture is it encourages the rapid development of the resource because of the potential for losing it to your neighbor. Okay? Now, obviously, that use it or lose it or the rule of capture creates some substantial negative externalities which are not dealt with in the common law definition of ownership or property rights that apply to oil and gas. There is within the common law development of the rule of capture going back to the last part of the 20th century, or to the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, sort of a movement to consider the fact that it is a property interest, but it really can't be exclusive because it is in a common source of supply. It is in a community-owned, re and I say community, not the public at large, but those who own the, surf, you know, the estate, uh, you know, the physical estate, uh, that there was some need to take into consideration and define your ability to use a community resource at the expense of having somebody else lose it. And that's the so-called correlative rights doctrine. The common law, however, with some exceptions, Indiana and Kentucky um, were the leading state, refused to go along with the notion that we should, as a common law property definition, restrict the rule of capture from preventing one owner of the common source from sucking it all out 
for his or her benefit. Replacing the common law were state conservation rules, which sort of you know, filled the vacuum that was, uh, that, that was caused by the overdrilling and the overproduction and the loss of natural um, energy within, a, uh, within an oil and gas uh, reservoir to produce oil and gas. And so what we had were state agencies, not the federal government, but state agencies coming in to impose upon the property, the common law property rights regime, a restrictions on the use it or lose it, so that you had to have spacing requirements and you had to do other things. There's another aspect of property rights in that, in the fact, and certainly common law decisions, in that there is always a lag time between technological developments and the common law changing to comply with those realities of the technology that are in existence. And the classic example is hydraulic fracturing and the notion of trespass, okay? Uh, and whether or not the injection of fluids 2,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 feet below the ground which migrate across surface property lines constitute a common law trespass. There are, you know, again, the technology is still not there so that we can determine with certainty beforehand whether or not there will be a physical invasion of one's property rights by such underground areas. But we're having issues that the common law property rights, which include the right to exclude. If I own Blackacre, excuse me for all of non-property non students, and you own Whiteacre, can I inject fluids 10,000 feet below the ground that literally invade your property interest. I mean, normally, again, the essence of property is the right to exclude. If I own White Acre, I should be able to exclude your frac fluids from, under, from going underneath my land. So we're having tensions uh, in the development of the use it or lose it and the property rights field that have to be developed, I would think, again, over time through common law system or through the regulatory system as we saw with spacing and conservation regulation. So because I, I will leave it to Stan Dempsey to elaborate on this, but you did gloss over the case where I think use lose it has the best rap, which is the federal government owns a lot of land where there are minerals. When the federal government gives leases to people to extract the minerals, those leases commonly include a use it or lose it requirement. They, uh, well, certainly the custom and practice of the way oil and gas is developed is through the oil and gas lease, which has a period of time negotiated between the parties, whether it's the federal government or the private owner, that will require production within that time. Otherwise, the lease, the fee simple, determinable, again, excuse me, terminates. Uh, and you do lose your fee simple determinable. That is correct. So, Charles, we have yet to talk about water, so I'd like to leave that to you along with any other reflections on this use it or lose it topic. Okay, I appreciate these earlier comments, and uh, thank you all for uh, coming over today. Um, water, Western water, and uh, hard rock minerals um, on federal public lands uh, have bodies of law that grew up exactly together out of the California gold camps. And they're both based, and David mentioned, uh, systems that have been used for the spectrum that include uh, deciding on how much good uh, a proposal produces or having a bidding system. And these two systems, with water and hard rock mining, uh, have nothing to do with either one because there's some governmental decisions to be made there, and both of these systems are just based on individual decisions, the idea that individuals make up the public interest. And so both water and hard rock minerals were open from the beginning under a rudimentary rule of capture, first in time, first in right. And um, it, of course, is more complicated than that, but neither can you forget 
uh, that overriding principle, first in time, first in right. And in the case of uh, hard rock minerals, use it or lose it, um, has this, and everyone who knows hard rock mining law or knows something about it, and I think almost anyone who does know something about it finds it delicious, uh, and Stan, I think, will reflect that later in the day because he's uh, one who's uh, lived it and, and really uh, has a passion for it that is infectious. But the, the hard rock mining law provides that you come in and the, you have a use it or lose it at the beginning in a doctrine called pettis possessio, which allows you to work an area without being interfered with by, by others. It's not a vested right. As soon as you make a discovery of a valuable mineral, and a discovery can be done out in the middle of nowhere without anybody else there, but if you strike it rich, at that moment you get an unpatented mining claim, which is one hell of a property right, without any transfer of paper. No paper's been transferred. You've just made the discovery. You're an individual, you've decided you want to mine there and take this out, and you've got a vested property right. Now, you have to keep it alive. And so you have to be able to show that using a balance sheet analysis, you're uh, proceeding economically and sensibly to work that claim. And as long as you do that, you keep your unpatented claim alive. And, it, and it's a powerful claim. You have exclusive use and, and, and enjoyment of that uh, uh, property. The United States has some prerogatives, but not all that many. You've got a right to continue mining and no royalties at all. None at all. Oil and gas, other minerals, uh, energy minerals, you got to pay royalties. No payments at all. And so I think that use it or lose it is, and, and really I will be interested in hearing uh, Stan's comments on this later, uh, from the standpoint of hard rock mining, I think plays a positive role um, in, in terms of uh, incentive to keep working diligently, but uh, maybe there are larger incentives such as uh, uh, not having to pay royalties that, that are as important and simply having a good mind that are as important. But I, I, I think that that plays somewhat of a positive role. Over on the water side, I, I, think, it's, I think it's different. Um, and again, and, uh, Ramsey will be talking about uh, water later and, and may want to address this. But, but I, I personally think of use it or lose it. Well, it definitely exists in water. And you either, you can lose it as a common law matter, depending on the state law, by abandonment or by forfeiture if there's a statute and it sets a fixed number of years. And again, shows, as with the unpatented mining claim, that these are not permanent interests, that they can be lost. Um, and, and in the case of water, though, uh, I just think in a global sense of water law, I don't think it's that major an issue. I'd stand corrected on that if others feel differently, but I don't think it is. I think what is global now and presents a, a a matter of, of great societal significance is the question of efficiency and conservation and waste. And um, we went so long without regulating either of these resources, mining, or there wasn't any regulation of mining on the public lands at all for 102 years after the Hard Rock Act was passed. There was none until 1974 when the Forest Service first took action. Over on the water side, um, we have had a lot of action on the establishment of rights so that we have general stream adjudications, which are a beautiful discovery and innovation that, that Westerners came up with to bring everybody on the stream in, and you have a list of who's first in time, first in right, and. Uh, uh, and how much uh, of a water right they have, how many acre feet uh, per year, or CFS. Um, and so you've got the rights being established. Then we went into a period starting in the late 1800s 
when you got state administrative agencies that themselves started issuing permits and holding in, uh, general stream adjudications or participating in them. Colorado has a judicial system that's complicated, but it's the same idea of spending a lot of time on the creation of the rights. But we, we just don't, haven't, we, we, are, we are in the infancy, even though we're doing things now and some of the cities are doing some good things, we're seeing some good things in agriculture. We're still in infancy in water in terms of conservation. And there's a lot of waste and there are a lot of big projects get proposed that if we, in fact, really were serious about preventing waste and inefficiencies, we wouldn't have to have those new supplies. We could get conservation out of existing uses. And so um, I think that's a much larger issue of efficiency and effectiveness than is uh, use it or lose it in, in, in the case of water. So let me take. So, I, I just would like to sort of give a little reaction to both those. It's what's interesting to me is to to hear how these two. And admittedly, as a guy whose job is communications and technology, water and mineral rights are not my forte. And not being from the West, uh, <laughs> water rights are not my not my forte. But hearing how some of these have played out, um, interestingly, in Spectrum, while un unlike the resources you all talk about, Spectrum is infinitely renewable across the time domain. Right. So every second the entire spectrum is made re-available. And so one of the things that has, we've been seeing start to play out is a way to try to apply some of these use it or lose it principles in an individual time domain. And so uh, during the last couple of years, we had the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology come forward with a proposal that looked at spectrum used by government users and said essentially, you know, on a, on a near instant basis, let's look to see, is the government using this spectrum? And if not, we should have a secondary set of users that can step in. So use it or lose it across a much shorter time domain. Um, while my feelings on the President's, uh, the PCAST report are pretty well known, I don't believe it's the best way to solve inefficiency in spectrum use. Um, it is an interesting case study in seeing some of the principles that the two professors have talked about uh, in, in terms of their application to something that is not the usual set of, of property rights. And let me segue a little more into Spectrum, picking off David's point. Spectrum has this other unique facet that you can actually have compatible use in the same time in the same place if people are, let's say, um, not using at power levels that create interference. So to pick Charles's point, you could have a system operating that sort of high power and then a very low power system that could come in even potentially without a license and use what you might call an underlay portion of the spectrum. And that, that person is more like the um, miner who comes in, just says, hey, I'm going to operate the system, and it's low power, won't interfere. It can actually operate side by side. And you could one way to think about this PCAS report is calling for that a little bit on steroids insofar as the government use. Um, one of the challenges in spectrum is to define and structure this concept of interference because you can maximize more spectrum use if you can create a way in which you limit harmful interference, which is the protection afforded to those who have licenses. And if that protection is not so great as to crowd out all possible users, you can have more intense use of the spectrum. I'd like to talk about that concept, which applies in oil and gas, it applies in water, and it applies in spectrum. In spectrum, historically, it was all done before the fact, um, where the FCC would say, okay, you can use this swath of spectrum, and then they'd prescribe the power levels and where the transmitters would be, and that was the way in which interference was managed, by before the fact approvals. There, war there weren't in spectrum after the fact adjudications, except in rare cases. From an institutional design standpoint, when you think about interference and how it's managed, what are your thoughts on how it's managed in each domain? So I'll let David start with spectrum. How do you judge the spectrum uh, regime in terms of how it deals with interference? So I'm, I'm going to get pretty far into the weeds, I think, for folks that aren't necessarily wireless people. But there's two kinds of interference that we're primarily talking about here, right? We're talking about co-channel interference, and we're talking about adjacent channel interference. And they're two very different problems. So co-channel interference is when you've got two spectrum bands that are on top of each other. Two users trying to use the same band at the same time. Very simplified way of thinking of this, all of your cell phones, if you're on the same carrier, 
you're all sharing the same frequency band. The reason that works is because you're all connecting to the same network base station. So if you're an AT&T user, AT&T is managing to make sure you don't interfere with each other within that band. The bigger problem becomes adjacent channel interference, which is when you've got two people next to each other that uh, are using two different separate frequencies, two different separate licenses, and may or may not have the economic incentive to work together. Um, the case that most people will probably know if I mention it, if, if you're going to know any spectrum issue, you might know this one, is the case of light squared and the GPS system. Um, you had Light Squared, which was a company that bought up some satellite licenses and wanted to turn them into a terrestrial network, meaning a cell network on the ground. Those systems operate at much higher power than satellite systems do, just as a, as a general matter. Um, when you start to sort of peel back the layers of the onion of, of the Light Squared GPS challenge, it became readily apparent that it was not a simple matter of having people just sit down and cut a check to each other and figure out how they were going to make this work which frankly, in the wireless industry, that's sort of how things happen now. If AT&T and Verizon have two licenses next to each other, they work it out. They have mutual economic incentive to make sure that their customers have a good experience, so they work it out through commercial agreements. LightSword and GPS were coming at it from two totally different places. The GPS band has what we call decoupled devices. So uh, essentially what that means is the satellite system is run by one person, the United States Department of Defense, and the pieces you use on the ground are sold by somebody else who has no relationship to the network owner. Unlike a cell phone network where odds are almost all of you probably got your cell phone from your cell phone carrier. Um, and what that ends up happening is you have people with very different power levels which are hard to resolve. You have very different network designs in terms of satellite transmitters, satellite receivers, cell phone transmitters, cell phone receivers. And, and you have a challenge in rights where you have to ask yourself whose rights are going to be honored. Um, do you honor the user's rights who bought a terminal for a GPS? Uh, and even though it may be not inter rejecting any interference from an adjacent band, has an expectation that that will continue to work? Or do you honor the licensee who got a license and who is following the power levels that they were told they could operate with? The bigger picture here is that in wireless in particular, and, and with, across most spectrum uses, we regulate how much interference you can put out in terms of the power levels. What we don't regulate is how much interference you have to reject as a receiver. And it's been an issue that's been talked about a lot recently. Who has the obligation to mitigate interference? Is it the person who's putting out the signal? Is it the person who's trying to receive another signal? Or is it some combination therein? And I've, I've sort of conflated a number of issues here, but the reality is is that these are 99% of what goes on in trying to figure out how to license spectrum. It's trying to figure out what constitutes interference, what constitutes harmful interference, and whose job it is to mitigate that interference. And when that's not done well, and the light squared case is a good case in point of, um, you might call it sort of a wreck on the side of the road, you end up with spectrum that doesn't get used efficiently, intensively, or in some cases at all. WCS, you mentioned earlier, was another band that we may get to. Joan Marsh lived through that experience. So um, the reality right now of spectrum is there's a lot of underused spectrum because we're not managing interference well. Um, Charles, it sounded like what you said about water that by not <coughs> defining and managing the rights well with some goals in mind, we're similarly missing an opportunity. Did I, I hear that right? And can you expound on that? Um, and again, we'll see this afternoon during the discussion on water, and, and Karen Sheldon, I think, will probably have thoughts on this also. But I'm, I'm going to put on the table that there is essentially no management of water. <laughs> you got to build the dam safely, and uh, there are... But in terms of uh, uh, breaking into the system of first in time, first in rights, we do almost nothing. Those rights are locked in. And so uh, when we talk about conservation, we have some cities, and Denver's one of them, who are doing some good things with conservation. They're essentially doing that on their own. Um, uh, 
and you have some people out in the irrigation districts who are doing some conservation. They're largely doing it on their own. Um, uh, and so I have real trouble applying the term management to our water system. I understand there are different governmental regulations of different kinds, but I don't think of it as managing the resources. I think of the primary thing that's happening is that private water users, who, by the way, paid nothing for those water rights, and at the moment they diverted the water, got a vested right to that water, and so we lost a whole bunch of incentives right there. We have to pay at the tap in our homes and in our businesses. We have to pay at the tap. But that's on, a, that's on a contract. We have a contract. That isn't a water right. That's a contract right with our provider. The developers pay nothing. They, they, they may have to pay for expensive diversion work, works, transportation costs, but they don't have to pay for the resource. No, nothing like a royalty or a, uh, a per acre foot uh, payment. And so, they, and so they have it for free, but they are locked in. And in, in terms of management, one of the biggest difficulties is trying to find water for in-stream flows to protect habitat, wildness, and beauty in our rivers that we care about a lot. There were no, the, the, the original water rights were all based on beneficial use. You had to put your water to a beneficial use. But boy, was beneficial a narrow concept. It was all consumptive development uses, municipal, industrial, ranch, uh, uh, hydro, farming, mining. Those were the uses, uh, and of course, uh, in, in people's homes. Had to be taken out of the stream. You, the, the law requires you took the water out of the stream. The law said the reasons we have rivers is to take water out of them. That's why we have rivers. But, if, 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 but, but let, let, me, let me just finish off real quickly. We, we, we did not make any inroads in that until 1955 in Oregon, where they had the first in-stream rights, 100 years after the Great Irwin against Phillips case. And then Colorado was second in 73 to re recognize in-stream rights. And today, if you want to get in-stream rights, because the rivers are mostly appropriated. So, 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 so the first-in-time, first-in-right seniors have the rights to the rivers. And, and, and if you come in as a junior with an in-stream flow to protect fish and rafting and so on, it's a very junior right and isn't worth much more than a dam. And so you have to buy out the senior rights. And so talk about lack of management. Everybody agrees that these in-stream values are important, widely believed society-wide, but we don't manage for it. We leave it up to individual purchases by uh, Water Trust. We have a good one in Colorado. The trend started in Washington. So yeah. if I could just make a connection, and, and a dangerous and exciting thing about this is few people know water and spectrum deeply in both areas. So I'll make a statement that is presumptuous because it may not hold true. But from what you said, Charles, it sounds like David gave the basis of what you could then say TV broadcasters for years who, like GPS, were uncoupled. <laughs> Uh, existed in a world where the receivers were really cheap, dumb receivers that required using a lot of spectrum, not conserving spectrum, in other words, not managing spectrum, because they could. And that left the resource uh, not intelligently managed, but yet that was the world that we're living in. It sounds like in water, ideally you would conserve water use, you'd leave enough for the fish and for the people fishing and for the rafters, but the risk is there are no incentives in the system for people to conserve their use and leave for it. Uh, and that challenge could be said to exist in both domains. That sounds right. So, <laughs> and not unsurprisingly, right, you, you've brought it up, right? You, you're talking about buying out rights. Uh, our incentive auctions are exactly My friends that. and the friends in the water uh, They'll have their whole panel community on are <laughs> raising hell with well, me, David but that's okay. Out that now we're doing something. We're doing something very similar to what you do in water rights in spectrum use. Trying so, to buy out the rights of the broadcasters and use the spectrum more efficiently. So it's interesting that it's unlike water rights where they're essentially fungible, right? Water is water. 
-hmm. to a certain extent. And I'm sorry to the water people that I'm being so general. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's be honest, water is water. Um, uh, not all spectrum licenses are created equal. So the broadcasters have very restrictive licenses. You can use that to be a broadcaster in your community of license at the power level you are authorized. That's what you can do with the license. The problem has been the, broad the broadcasters have had this huge swath of spectrum assigned to them that they're using sparsely. Um, you know, and I think even though a bit, this is why we have what we call white spaces. that's being used sparsely. Uh, but no one wanted to buy those spectrum licenses directly from the broadcasters because you could only use it to be a broadcaster. So unless you were already in that business, you had no reason to get in. The wireless providers, on the other hand, said, we've got, we've got income, we've got, we've got capital, we need more spectrum, but we don't want to be broadcasters. So we set up an incentive auction where essentially we use the FCC as a middleman. So the broadcasters are able to participate in a reverse auction in which they will put a value on their license. Uh, the FCC will conduct a forward auction in which wireless providers will put a value on a six megahertz spectrum license or whatever they end up rebanding it as when they finish their proceeding at the FCC. And the FCC acts as a middleman, basically collecting the arbitrage, saying, okay, we can take this much in, buying it back from the seniors who were first in time, first in right, the juniors whose industry only came to be in existence in the 90s in any real way, shape, or form, will be able to get the rights they need, and the federal government will collect the arbitrage between the two. And so it's interesting to hear you talking about Beginning to understand a little better, Phil, why you put me on a panel with water and mineral rights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you for going with me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Bruce, on oil and gas, how does you, you teed up the topic, you teased us in the wire, in the hydraulic fracturing, that you have this problem of neighbors and the rights being kind of regulated to guard against interference. Where does that stand and, and where do you see that going? Well, I, there are two areas when you're talking about oil and gas. One is the fact that in the United States, uh, except for the public lands, uh, oil and gas is a privately owned commodity that goes along with the ownership of the surface estate. So therefore, individual decisions have to be made within that private property system and, and the use it or lose it mental or property regime creates substantial externalities when it comes to waste, inefficiencies, and other things, which shouldn't, which shouldn't really happen in the publicly owned mineral spectrum, so to speak, where one owner can make decisions that would ostensibly be efficient given whatever information they have at the time. The problem with the private ownership and the very balkanized ownership of mineral resources is it's also a finite resource in the sense of a common source of supply has so much MCF of gas for so many barrels of oil. When owner one takes it out of the common source, it doesn't get replenished. It's like, to a certain extent, non-rechargeable aquifers in the groundwater situation. But it's gone forever, at least from somebody's ownership you know, pot. Therefore, it, it took the states to come up with a scheme to avoid everybody, and uh, uh, to avoid the kind of overdrilling, loss of natural pressure, loss of the ability to recover the resources. Uh, and they did, or they stepped into, it, uh, into that phrase starting in the 1900s. The problem with management is long before there was OPEC and cartels and price fixing, there were Railroad Commission and the Kansas Corporation Commission and the Oklahoma Corporation Commission attempting to impose upon private property owners uh, limits on the amount that they could produce. They attempted to manage the resource in order to basically maintain a, price, a, a minimum price scheme, and it was done by the Railroad Commission in Texas and others uh, throughout the mid-continent area, and it was a failure. I mean, they got a lot of people angry. They obviously did not do much uh, to protect uh, the pricing uh, and the like. And so the management of the resource by the state agencies that were, uh, you know, that were supposed to be regulating really didn't do much to eliminate the inefficiencies, although it created, uh, again, unintended consequences, which we are still dealing with today uh, in that. I'm not so sure 
that you know imposing a management a top down management scheme in the oil and gas area uh, is a successful way or is a the most efficient way of dealing with it uh, as opposed to a combination of the notion of private rights combined with some of the uh, restrictions on use it or lose it that avoid community harms that you get with loss of reservoir pressure, with overdrilling and the overcommitment of resources and the like. Mm. So I want to move to the audience. And as I said, first question goes to a student. Not, not afraid to call on people either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so you're close, Laura. But before I go, I want to see if anyone else has a question. Stephanie does. All right. Right here. Hi. Thank you for having this panel. This is fantastic. It's nice to hear the, the different um, ideas that are across all these different areas of, of law. Um, I was struck by the Pettus uh, Possessio concept, and I was wondering, um, David, if you thought that this idea of working in an area um, and then being able to reap something from it, and then from there gaining uh, a property right of it, if that's similar to what's going on in the unlicensed space at all. Um, the progeny proceeding said something along the lines of unlicensed users that are in this space are not going to be subject to unacceptable levels of harmful interference. And I'm just wondering if the, um, if you see the correlation between the two and if it's concerning to you that you know what was a common space may be moving in a direction which is you know giving uh, rights to people that didn't have some uh, didn't have any in, originally sure yeah, but before I answer it just because I know we've lost two-thirds of the audience here <laughs> um, so again spectrum has a division between two types of users those who get a license to operate and have something that's more approximate to a property right. And those who are unlicensed operators, which are more like those miners who just show up and are operating in a way that's not harming anyone who has a license. Gail Haffey will be very proud of Stephanie's question. Stephanie says, gosh, I noticed that some people who get into this world as an unlicensed operator who are specifically told you have no rights against anybody else seem to be claiming or expecting that they maybe kind of do have some kind of rights. Is that a trend, David, that you see? And any views on that trend? Sure. And, and so hmm. I should start by saying the, the reason I was, I was sort of giving Phil a, a, little, a little ribbing was that you know, in, in Spectrum, it's, very, it's a very well-established legal standard that you do not have a property right in Spectrum, um, that Spectrum licenses do not confer property rights. Um, that being said, the practical reality is that the system we've set up does confer some sort of quasi-property right. Um, a 10-year license term, billions of dollars of investment, and what we call a renewal expectancy, which essentially says, if you live up to the terms we asked you to live up to, we'll renew you for another term at the end of your current license term, create a quasi-property right. I mean, it's, at a certain point, you, it's a pretty safe bet you're not going to lose your license if you keep moving forward. Um, unlicensed, on the other hand, is in some ways even more of a, of a property right, at least in terms of the way we look at it in public policy. Uh, it is usual that when you're taking back a license from a company, that that company is failing. And if that company is failing, they don't have customers. And if they don't have customers, there's nobody to complain except the company itself. Um, unlicensed, on the other hand, presents you with the possibility of 300 million Americans waking up one morning and finding out that as it turns out, the 5 gigahertz spectrum we use for Wi-Fi is not going to be used for that anymore. Or the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum we use for Wi-Fi won't be used for that anymore. Um, as someone who works for members of Congress, I can tell you the idea of having everyone who has Wi-Fi in their home calling my bosses and complaining that we screwed up their Wi-Fi spectrum is not something I ever want to sit through. Uh, and so in some ways, you end up with a quasi-property right by the sheer number of people who are using something. And so, yeah, I think you're spot on. And, and we, we've seen this happen, right? Essentially, once you put something into the commons and you put those devices out there, it's hard to pull them back. It is, in some ways, what happened with LightSquared and GPS. Interestingly, what's happening now is that we are trying to transition our unlicensed users to a new paradigm. 
Right now, the devices are all independent. They coordinate with each other using a number of technologies I won't get into because I'll bore you all to sleep. But uh, we're moving now towards the idea of using databases. So essentially, if you've got a multi-band unlicensed device, that if one of those bands goes away, the database tells the devices that band isn't available anymore or isn't available here if it's a mobile device, and you're able to swap in and out. I think it's one way to sort of claw back the idea that once you put license, uh, unlicensed spectrum out there, you can never reclaim it. Um, but we're a long ways off from that. And in reality, unlicensed spectrum, once it gets allocated for the most <coughs> it's out there. If I may make a comment about uh, analogies, um, it looks to me like, like you're talking about if you, we're not calling it a property right, but it's something on, akin to a defeasible property right. And it's def just like an oil and gas lease. It's potentially infinite in duration as long as you comply with whatever the particular regulations are. And then the unlicensed users, you know, uh, to me, reflect upon the common law doctrines of adverse possession and e uh, prescriptive easements. And one of the other phrases I would use is facts on the ground. And unlicensed, in a way, is not as problematic as what you might call squatters and people who were using or still are using wireless microphones, that includes us right now, <laughs> um, are using spectrum that was never authorized for that purpose. But yet they created facts on the ground. Um, one last question, and Anne, I think you have one, so let's go to you before we uh, break. Well, I just want to point out that Charles, I think the, the, the people who care about the water in rivers who, I'm sorry, Charles, I think the people who care about water and rivers for everything from aesthetic and spiritual to recreational use are a lot like those unlicensed users. They don't technically have a property right, and they may not yet have the power with the House in Congress that they do, that those wireless guys do, but, but that's, they have a similar kind of slowly having an effect saying, we have some kind of right here, or at least, I mean, I see that all the time in protests about, you know, big new projects. It's people who don't have water rights, but they like their river. So I think there is a, a comparable thing there. Yeah. Although, interestingly, in unlicensed spectrum, if enough people show up to use it, nobody gets to use it. So uh, you have diminishing That's true about the rivers, too, by the way. Yeah, I guess fair enough. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're the only unlicensed user in an area, you can use the whole band. If you end up with enough unlicensed users, nobody gets to use the band because it becomes effectively unusable. You have such a small slice. This was what it was like when I was in college. Well, we, um, <laughs> we will have to think about this, because this is almost a whole conference topic, which is this public use of the resource, whether it's rivers or the spectrum, how you organize it and how you organize the users is its own challenging problem. And I think it's a great testament to you all that you've teed that up and so many other issues so well. Um, we're going to take a few minutes to transition panels, but first let me thank our overview panels for a great discussion.